Hey, it's Mazzy. I have a question for you. Are there records in your collection that you've listened to over a thousand times? I would cite, you know, some Beatle albums, some Dylan, some Kinks, probably some Stones, and there's probably others here and there. But I was, I was trying to think to myself, is there one record that I've listened to more than anything else? A record that I constantly reach for when I can't decide what to put on? And for me, this is a perfect album from 1976, the self-titled album uh, from Warren Zevon's Asylum debut, uh, 1976, produced by Jackson Brown. Uh, Warren did have an album uh, prior to this, uh, an album called Dead or Alive, on a smaller label that didn't get any notice until this came out when it was reissued. He also toured uh, with the Everly Brothers. He was their arranger, piano player, went on tour with them for a number of years, and he's classically trained pianist, very influenced by Aaron Copeland. So this stuff is very Western America, Americana. Uh, Copeland wrote Appalachian Spring, Billy the Kid, Rodeo. Uh, this has that sound. This is widescreen cinema version of a record. All these wonderful LA uh, singers, musicians from the scene of the some of the biggest artists in LA in the mid 1970s sing backgrounds on this, sing harmonies on this. In fact, Warren Zevon's probably the worst singer on the album, but think of it like Bob Dylan. I mean, you don't want Bob Dylan to sound like uh, Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys or something. He brings these other singers in that supplement his voice and his great songwriting, especially his wonderful lyrics and great arrangements. And uh, he worked on this for such a long time. I have the demos that just came out on a Rhino expanded vinyl series. That's why I'm doing this, uh, which I bought. I just uh, received it a couple of days ago and I've compared three different versions of this album for you and for me, uh, for us, the collective us. Um, I'm going to go through this album. This is my original 1976 copy on Asylum Records. This is, to me, a perfect record. It's a singer-songwriter record plus. It's a, um, what kind of music is it? It's a rock record. There's rock on it. Is it, is it full of ballads, singer-songwriter stuff? Absolutely. But it's a majestic album. And uh, if you're in the right mood, this is just... Let your mind go, listen to the lyrics, read the lyrics. There is a um, lyric sheet that came in uh, with the record on all the versions of the record, and his uh, records are top-notch. The underbelly of Hollywood, L.A., mid-'70s, the darkness of L.A. Um, think of L.A. bands that really kind of wrote about the time. The Doors might be another one. Uh, Jim Morrison's writings, too. They're not specifically about places, necessarily. Although he does cite places. But he cite, he writes about Americana, too, in the Great West. Uh, the opening track, Frank and Jesse James. Waddy Wachtell on guitar. David Lindley, banjo and fiddle. Uh, Bob Glaub, bass. Larry Zach, drums. Phil Everly, obviously from the Everly Brothers, on this great harmony that supplements his voice. That opens up with this great, almost like... Uh, a uh, classical uh, opus opening, the, almost like the overture here, and it goes into this piano playing. It's just really wonderful. Not a big band at all, but just really tight. But the uh, the orchestration that uh, Warren uh, wrote for this is just a magnificent opener. Mama Couldn't Be Persuaded has kind of this great uh, bass, funky thing with vocals by uh, John David Souther and Jackson Brown. So again, Beautiful, pristine voices supplementing Warren Zevon. Backs turned, looking down the path. Another great song, Hasten Down the Wind, of course, uh, with uh, Phil Everly again on harmonies. A song that Linda Ronstadt would take, put on an album, and literally title an album that used uh, Hasten Down the Wind as one of her great 1970s classic records. Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me, another song Linda Ronstadt takes, rocks out with. This, I think, is the better version. Warren Zevon rewrites a verse, especially for Linda. Uh, you have uh, Lindsey Buckingham doing this great harmony. And what's great about it, you recognize, if you know these voices, you recognize all of them individually. They're not pushed back, but they're not overly, you know, taking away from Warren's lead voice, which is slightly, uh, which 
rises above them uh, somewhat. Uh, there are three centerpiece songs on here, in, for my opinion. It's, and again, it is like a symphony or an opera in a way, where you have uh, Frank and Jesse James, as I said, that very Americana Copeland-esque opening. The end of side one, you have the French Inhaler, wonderful song uh, with these great harmonies at the end from Glenn Fry and Don Henley. Whether you like the Eagles or not, those guys have killer vocals and just blend beautifully. And that's what a wonderful dark song of um, of Hollywood. I mean, reading the lyrics to that. Mohammed's Radio open side too. But the final song on it, Desperados Under the Eve, is that final epic that lifts everything up with the Gentleman Boys closing harmonies of Carl Wilson, Billy Hinch, Jackson Brown, Warren Zevon. Just this glorious lift to the end of the record. Of course, there's other songs, Join Me in L.A., with Rosemary Butler and Bonnie Raitt on vocals. Carmelita, the dark side of, of scoring in L.A., Meeting His Man, Heroin Junkie, uh, Sleep When I'm Dead. Uh, again, every song on here, Mohammed's Radio, again with Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham. You have these singers and musicians who were the cream of the crop in L.A. in the mid-1970s. Some studio musicians, some from their own bands that helped Warren Zevon in this, you know, debut, one of the greatest debuts ever. Of course, around the same time, he had this huge collection of songs. Most people only know Werewolves of London, which they saved. They purposely left it off this to put it on the next album to keep some songs for the next album, Excitable Boy. And it's unfortunate. As great as that song is, it's fun and novelty in a way, song that is. It's too bad that's the only song a lot of people know of Warren Zevon because it's certainly not one of his greatest songs here. Uh, this is my original Asylum Records copy, 1976. I'll tell you right now, this is the best sounding version I have. This is open. It's dynamic. There's enough bass. It's not the one of the three with the heaviest bottom, but it's well balanced. But I like what this is the vocals, especially when you get all the harmony vocals. You've got many songs here with two or three or four vocalists harmonizing with him. And I found on the other ones, sometimes they get congested when they build up, when they get loud. Here, it's not like that. If you can find an original copy of this, this would certainly be my first choice. Over the years, Rhino, uh, the reissue wing, catalog wing of Warner Brothers has issued several copies. I bought one, even though I love that, I bought one in 2009. There's a hype sticker. Uh, this is the one I believe that's been in print for the last decade or so, repressed several times. And this was cut by Kevin Gray. And I'm one that usually loves virtually everything Kevin Gray does. And, you know, I, I think at this point, when this came out, even 12 years ago, what, well, 15 years ago now, uh, I really didn't follow mastering engineers and knew of, the, of, of their work uh, like I do now. So I probably didn't even look in the dead wax when this came out. But I remember putting this record on and the first track, obviously, that beautiful epic with the piano, at first starting with that uh, string and orchestration of uh, Frank and Jesse James, it seemed off to me. It seemed a little veiled and muffled. And then the vocals came in and I just thought, what's wrong with this? I had issues with it. Now, later on in the record, it does get better, opens up. It's it's. It's, to me, hit and miss. I was really surprised. Again, I didn't know anything about uh, who did this or anything. And I remember, those are the days you could write to Dr. Rhino. And I wrote, and someone responded to me right away. And the guy said, you know, I don't, we don't think there's anything wrong, but I'll, he sent me another copy. Same thing. So I gave those away. Probably about five years ago, I picked up another copy with it because I have a different system. And to me, it's same thing. This week, I just played this one. Same thing, especially on the open track. Now, the highs are clipped off, and some people think that usually Kevin opens up and the highs are bright. Some people think that Rhino likes his brightness. That's certainly not the effect here. Now, if you turn it up, it does improve somewhat, but I would, you know, pot up really loud my original Asylum uh, 76 copy, and it works at all volume levels. Hasten Down the Wind, the ballads work better on here. When they, when they notch it up and not poor, poor pitiful me, I, I'm just disappointed with this one. Now you have to turn it up louder, which I don't have a problem with. 
Again, I don't know what it is. It comes with the same insert. Um, this is the one that's been in print. I've heard other people say they're fine with it. To so subjective. But again, I know this record so well, more than almost any other record in my record collection, literally listening to it a thousand times. So maybe that's the problem. I know what to expect. I have something in my in my sense memory thing that feels it should sound a certain way. But I was kind of disappointed with this uh, Rhino version from 2009 that's been in print, uh, reasonably priced, but in print. So uh, this is third. If I had to count it out of the three I'm showing here, this is number three from my point of view of a record that I know better than any other record. Now we're going to the Rhino Summer, Sounds of the Summer. Now they're doing a whole series of, of great reissues. They always do great catalog reissues. I purchased this with my own money because uh, it's a favorite of mine. Now I've had the CD, the expanded CD. This one has outtakes, demos, and alternatives. And I already know those. That's the primary reason I bought another copy because I didn't have these. These haven't been on vinyl before. And now they're on vinyl because I love his demos. You really understand how he arranges music and how great these songs, the core of these songs, even before uh, the, the wonderful production, how great these songs uh, really are. Uh, this says, original self-titled album, cut from the analog master tapes, black vinyl, one LP of bonus tracks on black vinyl for the first time. The bonus tracks. I'm taking this off now. I don't need it. I wanted to show you, but I don't really keep hype stickers here. Uh, this is a gatefold that has the insert here on the gatefold rather than a separate uh, insert like that. And this new Rhino cut was uh, mastered by Bernie Grunman. There's a BG in the Dead Wax. I don't know when. I don't know if it's a brand new cut, but I don't recall any previous uh, Bernie Grunman cut. So I assume it's uh, something done recently for this release. Again, I don't know the details on that. I listened to this, and it, the first thing I heard when I put on Frank and Jesse James, that leads me in. That tells me where this journey is going to go for this album for me. That's why on the uh, last cut, the Kevin Gray cut, it, it set me off a little bit at the beginning. Now, that could be uh, uh, an error on my part that I kind of followed that through, even though some of the songs were better than others. This opened up quite nicely. The orchestration was great. It was wide again. This opens up. It's rich. It's opened up. Right, I was waiting for the vocals to be dampened, and they weren't. The vocals were actually quite good. The bass was deeper. Too deep? That's subjective. The drums were snappier. Still, I like the first version. I like this. The problem on this version, this new Reiner version for me, now I have an MC cart. Tends, MC carts tend to be a little bright. But all of a sudden, when the harmony vocals came in and there's two or three people singing on this record, it started tightening up and not in a good way. It, there was no separation with the voices. On the original one, with the two or three part harmonies, you'd hear these beautiful, angelic uh, singers back there and worn in the foreground. And these tightened up. They didn't sound good. And then as it went on and it kind of kicks in, in the Tom Missouri farm, the West was very young. I'm going to sing for you. All of a sudden in the last minute and a half, and it was kind of a softer part, there was this huge, massive ripping sound. You know, when you get ripping, stitching on a record, I rarely get stitching on a record and it was zip. I took it out, I cleaned it, it's still there. Two or three times I got stitching sounds on this record and it wasn't just slight, it, they were massive. It was like, oh my God, jumping out of my seats. Now I don't see anything visually, so I'm not quite sure what the problem is and hopefully it's an aberration on this copy. I gotta figure out how to exchange this uh, in Groove <laughs> or, or reaching out to Rhino Records. But there was congestion in those group vocals and I found on every song, where you have two or more people singing when it when it reached a crescendo it tightened up not in a good way 
Again, the base and everything else was tight. Warren Zevon is nice. Sometimes it's a little brittle on the high end. So where the Kevin cut, I thought the highs seemed clipped to me based on my uh, knowledge and my love of the original. Uh, some of this was too shrill, only in the vocals, not in the music. Uh, the acoustic guitars on Carmelita were really good. Still the uh, original or better. The acoustic guitars on this, the bass playing uh, is really good on this. So I'm really cu curious if uh, this is a one-off problem on this issue or if other people are having the same issues on it. So I need to rectify this. Uh, still my go-to will be uh, the um, original. I haven't listened to the outtakes on here. I do have them on CD, so I will be listening to that. I like those. Uh, most people don't need those. That's someone like me who's all in on Warren Zevon. I have every single uh, Warren Zevon album and uh, one of my all-time favorite artists here. Uh, so uh, that is my take on uh, Warren Zevon self-titled. The best one is the original 1976. Second best is this, but with an asterisk, hopefully that stitching uh, is not on every copy because that is really bad. And lastly, um, I hate to say it, that Kevin Gray, and I usually like that. That's the one that's been around for 15 years on Rhino. And I've gone through three copies over 15 years. So uh, they all are the same. Um, and now, a, a little footnote here. About three years ago, uh, there was a promo from Mobile Fidelity that they were going to issue the self-titled record and Excitable Boy. And I pre-ordered them from Music Direct. A year goes by, more than a year. I finally get a notice. We're ready to ship Excitable Boy. That's coming out. And then I get an, and I got that, and it's fabulous. Excitable Boy and MoFi is a great version of it. But then they announced that they were not doing this album. They all of a sudden canceled it. So um, my order was obviously canceled. I never knew. I was always curious, is there something wrong with the tape? Uh, is there a licensing issue? But it was surprising me they could do uh, one album and not do uh, this album. The first two albums are perfect albums in the war. Uh, Warren's even uh, discography. I tend to go for this one first. To me, this is the better album overall, but the second one is amazing as well. And he's never made a bad album, and he had a tempestuous career with uh, drugs and alcohol, and, and unfortunately died way too young of cancer. Uh, so Warren Zevon, self-titled album, 1976. Love this record. Thanks for watching. Mazzy loves you.